Occupational English test. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Um, so, Anita, what has brought you to counselling? So, I've been in a relationship with somebody for about six months. Um, okay. I wanted us to move forward with our relationship and, you know, get married. And he he's not on the same page as me, and it's causing a lot of tension. And then, in addition to that, my mother's very unwell. Um, mm. So, I have a lot of things to deal with at home with her as well. And then. Um, my boss is putting a lot of pressure on me to deliver um, everything on time, and so I'm just having some trouble juggling everything at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I can see that um, all of these combined are, are making you feel quite overwhelmed. Oh, very. And it's just really, there are some times when I just come home and I have to deal with my mother and I have to deal with my relationship, and then I have to go to work the next day and I'm having trouble with that, and it just makes me really upset. Okay, yeah. And I'm wondering, Anita, how um, how long have you been dealing with all of these issues? Oh, um, it's probably ramped up in the last three months. Um, but I've been in the in my relationship for six months, and my mum's been sick uh, for the last three, four months. So it's not that new, but it's it's now starting to get worse. So yeah, yeah. Um, so, how have you been coping so far with all of these these pressures? Not very well, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just take it day by day, and um, yeah, communication is a bit of a difficult one. Like I said, this is my first time doing counselling, and yeah. don't really have anyone else I can turn to. So yeah, mm. it's very hard. Yeah. Um, I, I do understand that it is very hard to, to seek um, support in, in such personal issues, but that's what we're here for and that's what um, we're hoping that we can do with, um, with this session as well. Um, so given that this session's um, very different to the other ones, I just wanted to know, you told me that you um, are experiencing some concerns with your partner because you want to move forward and he's not in the same uh, places you and your mother's quite sick and um, you're looking after her as well so that's an area of concern for you and then you have some pressures with work um, so I'm just wondering if we could prioritize any of those concerns what would the, the biggest concern be? Um, well probably dealing with my mother and my relationship are probably quite equal because my mother's also putting a lot of pressure on me to yeah. get married obviously she's not well so um, you know, she wants to see her family happy. Yeah, yeah. Dealing with that situation is probably the number one thing for me at the moment. And the work thing I can deal with because I try not to bring work home, but obviously that's a bit hard too. Yeah. 
So when you say dealing with that concern, do you mean working uh, the relationship with your mother or the relationship with your partner? Probably with my partner first because, yeah, I feel like I'm putting a lot of pressure on him yeah. because of what's happening with my mother. Yeah. Okay. So what we, we can do is, um, if it's okay with you, focus on that area first and we will look at all the areas that are overwhelming you, um, but we can start by working on that that issue first, if that's okay. Yeah? Yep. Excellent. Um, so we only have a couple more minutes before the session ends um, and I was wondering if you had any other questions before we, um, we go and sign the contract. And um, no, just maybe in terms of the number of counselling sessions I'll need. I know you said that the first six are free, um, but obviously money is a bit of a factor as well. So what happens if I have to go over the um, six sessions? Yeah, um, and I do apologise. I said when we will go and sign the contract, but you already signed it. But um, So if you go over the six sessions, it will be $70 after for each session. Um, and you can, like I said, you can um, continue as long as you need to. So it's really difficult to find a time for every single person and, and have a set time. So we like to see how it goes and together we can work out what the best um, time frame is for, for yourself. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so if you don't have any other questions, we can book another time in next week. For you? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do I speak to reception about that? Yeah, well, I'll come out with you and we can um, sort that out. Great, thank you. Okay, it was lovely meeting you. Nice and thank you, you so much for um, for uh, opening up and, and having that chat with me. Um, and we'll focus on uh, the, the first um, topic of you and your partner. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Now look at the notes for Extract 2. Extract 2 Now, Jane, just before we begin, can I start by asking you your age? Uh, I'm 25. Okay. And what brings you in today, Jane? What's the problem? Um, well, I've been feeling a bit tired for the past few weeks, and I don't seem to have much energy to do anything, really. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's wrong with me. Okay. Um, well, tell me a little bit more about it. Um, well, I started to get tired about four weeks ago, and it's really yes. persisted since that time. Um, and I've actually had to stop playing netball because I've, I've been so tired. Um, when it started off, I had some aches and pains in my muscles, and um, but they seem to have settled down now, and it's really just the, the tiredness that's persisting. And um, I've got exams in a few weeks, and I'm really worried that I won't be able to study properly because I'm feeling so tired. I see. Goodness, that must be very distressing for you. Yeah, it's really worrying me. Yeah. What uh, What are you studying? I'm a social work student. I see. Well, tell me, um, apart from the aches and pains that you noticed initially with this illness, was there anything else in particular that you'd noticed? Um, it, it sort of started quite suddenly, really, and, and when it started, I had a bit of a cold, um, you know, a bit yes. of a blocked up head and a, a runny nose. Um, and I actually went to the doctorate student health at the university yeah. and he said I just had a virus and I didn't need any treatment and it would go away. Um, and he didn't do anything else than that really. Right, okay. So at the moment, just to let me clarify again, the main problem now is tiredness. All of the other symptoms have, have settled down. Um, yeah, just really tired and I can't do anything really. Right, okay. Well, just before I actually start examining you, can I ask you a few just general questions before we get started, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what's your appetite and weight been like? Um, my appetite's been fine. I've been eating the same amount and my weight's steady. Okay, and have you been running any fevers recently? No, 
No. Um, four weeks ago when I had a bit of a cold, I thought I had a bit of a temperature then, um, but nothing now. Mm, okay. And um, your bowel habits? I've been regular. Regular. That's good. All right. Well, look, I think um, at this stage I'd like to have a bit of a look at you and um, we'll talk about um, things after that, okay? All right. All right. Right, Jane. Having had a look at you, I think really the major things that uh, that are noticeable are that you've you've uh, got some scattered glands around your body. Okay, those lumps that I felt um, in the neck, armpits, and down in the groin regions, and you may have also noticed a bit of discomfort up in the left side of your abdomen, high up, when I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And yes. that um, that is the site of a of an organ called the spleen, which is also a, a type of gland which is also enlarged. Okay. Mm. So what I does that think, mean? I think all of these really point to some form of viral illness, quite possibly um, glandular fever. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask as well. Are you absolutely sure it's glandular fever? Mm. It's highly suggestive, okay. I can't be totally certain um, at this stage without really doing um, some tests to confirm it, and I think that would be a good idea to do. What sort of tests are they? It's a blood test, and it will involve a small sample of blood being taken. Really, what I'll do is do a specific test for glandular fever as well as looking at your blood in general to make sure that there are no other possible problems there. And that can tell for sure if it's glandular fever? Uh, it, yes, that's correct. Right. Um, and when you do the blood test, can you see if I'm anemic as well? Yes, certainly. Is that a particular concern of yours? Yeah, well, I've been having all those ads on the TV, you know, about if you don't eat enough meat, then you might be anemic, especially if you're tired. And I was wondering if that was my problem as well. Okay, I mean, tiredness certainly can be... Uh, one of the symptoms of anemia and I think it's justified that you're concerned about it particularly given the, the publicity that we've been having but um, I can fairly confidently reassure you just on having examined you that that would be very unlikely in your case okay but we can certainly uh, run that test and in fact I was going to run that test as a routine anyway oh, oh that's good Right. What you need to do really at this stage is rest, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there are no specific remedies that I can give you for this illness. Um, we can't cure it. Your own body will cure it by, by fighting it off, but that will take a bit of time. Um, how long exactly? Again, I can't, I can't be certain. Hopefully within the next week or two you'll be feeling a lot better, but that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, at home, really, um, you need to keep up your diet and keep up your fluid intake, and really we're going to have to organise to meet again and just make sure that this is slowly settling with time. That is the end of part A. Now, turn over and look at part B. Part B, questions 25 to 30. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. The new draft recommendations make three points. The first point is that uh, WHO recommends a reduced intake of free sugars throughout the life course. The second recommendation is that the intake of free sugars in both adults and children should not exceed 10% of total energy intake. 
But we also make a third recommendation, and that is that a further reduction to less than 5% of total energy gives additional health benefits. We uh, know that uh, dietary risk factors are very important factors for the risk of non-communicable disease. We have an epidemic of non-communicable diseases. We, we have at the moment uh, uh, 36 million people dying from non-communicable diseases, most of them in, in the developing world, 80%. Uh, we have a projection of 50 million for 2030, so, it, so it's huge. And uh, dietary risk factors, uh, as well as uh, uh, tobacco, are one of the main determinants of, uh, of, of those diseases. I mean, if you remove uh, uh, the, the risk factors, then a lot of those deaths can be preventable. Question 26. Now, read the question. Um, overall, what we found were some very reassuring things um, for physicians caring for women with epilepsy and for women with epilepsy who are planning to become pregnant. Because what we found is, counter to previous dogma, I think, uh, women with epilepsy are not at a substantially increased risk of um, having to have a C-section during their delivery, late pregnancy bleeding, or premature contractions or delivery. Also, the findings strongly support that um, if a woman is seizure-free for a period of time, nine months to one year prior to becoming pregnant, it's very likely that she will continue to remain seizure-free um, throughout the pregnancy. So this is very reassuring information to uh, women and their physicians as they plan uh, going ahead with pregnancy. Question 27. Now read the question. Opioids like codeine have very limited evidence in the management of chronic persistent pain. I think our role in the pharmacy is to have the conversation with patients, to help them understand the biopsychosocial model of, of chronic pain and to shift their expectations towards improving their function rather than expecting a cure of their pain. We also need to refer these patients to a GP for a comprehensive assessment. Annoyed customer, this will take more time out of our busy schedules and more money out of our pockets on pain relief thanks to those who abuse it. It's important to help consumers understand that codeine is a highly addictive drug. We know that tolerance, dependence and addiction to codeine can develop very quickly. And that many people are self-diagnosing and self-treating with codeine combination products available over the counter. I think it's important that we can reassure patients that there are alternatives available in the pharmacy and that if they do need codeine containing products that they can still get them on prescription from their GP. Question 28. Now read the question. The aged care channel for me takes a lot of the pressure off having to research, find out information. The staff are accepting of it, so it's it's just another tool, another resource that we use very often. And um, I'd have to say, they they embrace it because it's something they can go and do on their own, but it's also something also something we can do as a group. The Aged Care Channel is uh, pivotal in our training and development resources. It's um, something that we use all the time. It's part of induction, it's part of ongoing education, it helps registered nurses with their ongoing professional um, learning. Uh, we couldn't do without it. Oh, the Aged Care Channel is a, a great part of um, our training and developing um, 
resource. It, it's the biggest part. Um, we certainly have libraries, lending libraries in each facility. Um, as I said, it's part of the induction progress, so it, it's um, pivotal. We, we couldn't do without it. The channel to me is a different tool. We don't have the equipment or the skills to make DVDs or live television, so it brings another type of learning, because everyone learns differently, um, right into rooms right across the villages. So for us it's it's a different method um, and a lot of the staff really respond to that rather than someone just talking at them. So the interaction, the the um, acting, the scenario all, all adds to the learning. Question 29. Now read the question. The idea here is to take those cells out of her body or, or patients' bodies and reprogram them. That's, that's the term for gene editing. Reprogram those cells to, to identify cancer, put them back into the body in much larger quantities so that the army has expanded, and then, and then see if that can fight the cancer. It's been, it's been an early story at, uh, over the last couple of years, but the early results are quite promising in leukemia and lymphoma. We've seen a, a couple of years ago in melanoma, and studies are now getting started in other cancers like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. Very exciting story. We at our center uh, in Nashville just six days ago opened a trial uh, in the community for patients with lymphoma, so very exciting time. Well, we've always known that uh, there's a genetic link to a number of cancers. Uh, the, the big struggle is identifying whether a, a particular genetic abnormality in an individual, say, at an early point in their life is going to lead to the development of cancer. So we know for several cancers there's a, there's a high risk with certain genes. I guess the, the one that uh, has caught a lot of attention over the last several years has been what's called the BRCA or BRCA genetic uh, alterations that lead to an increased risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So understanding more, more correlations like that, if you have this genetic abnormality at birth or later in life, is that going to lead to the de development of cancer? A lot of work still in that area. We're learning it's, it's a combination of, of those genetic risks and probably environmental risks as well. So it, it may not just be one thing that leads to the development of cancer for the majority of people. Question 30. Now read the question. All right, so uh, Mrs. Smith is a 68 year old lady. She was admitted three days ago with an exacerbation of the CMPV. She had a four day history of increasing shortness of breath on exertion, not relieved by her puffers. She has no comorbidities and no infection control precautions. She stopped smoking after her first admission about two years ago and she lives at home alone with support from her daughter. She's on IV antibiotics, bronchodilators, and steroids, and she's on two litres of oxygen via the nasal prongs. She has all the call and criteria for oxygen saturations. The target range is 88 to 92 percent because she retains CO2. This is Miss other vital signs in between the flags, and she needs QID ops and had some spirometry done yesterday, which the team are going to review today. She reports having a fall at home about a month ago, but she's otherwise independent with her ADLs. Uh, falls risk was low, but I use the override option to get make her a high falls risk because of her recent falls history. Uh, she's been assessed by the physio, and she's on a rollator frame for it to ambulate. Uh, water load score is 10 and her skin integrity is intact and she's responded well to all treatment and she's on a normal diet. That is the end of part B. Now turn over and look at part C. Part C, questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, 
Choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now, look at extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Now, answer question one. The word migraine is derived from the Greek word meaning pain in half the head, as migraine often produces a unilateral or one-sided headache. It is a common and distressing disorder, and although they are not likely to take life, migraines can destroy the quality of life. Studies have shown the incidence of migraine to be in the range of 9 to 10 percent and it affects 17 percent of the female population and 6 percent of the male population. So about 2 million Australians can expect to suffer from migraine uh, and that translates to 1.5 million women and about 500,000 men. It is thought that more women suffer migraine than men due to hormonal factors. There are several types of migraine, the two main types being classical migraine and common migraine. Classical migraines are preceded by an aura, the duration of which varies between 15 minutes up to almost an hour. The headache usually lasts 6 to 8 hours, although they can last up to 72 hours. Common migraines are not preceded by an aura and the headache lasts between 4 and 72 hours and can be pulsating and unilateral. An upset stomach and vomiting are common symptoms. Migraines can be divided into a number of distinct phases. The first phase includes the early warning symptoms. A significant number of migraine sufferers experience warning symptoms for up to 24 hours before the attacks start, but may not recognise these signs unless they know what to look for. The common symptoms include changes in mood, and these moods can vary from elation, such as feeling on top of the world and full of energy, to opposite moods, such as feeling depressed and irritable. There are several abdominal symptoms common to migraine, including nausea, changes in appetite, such as intense hunger or sugar craving, constipation, and diarrhea. Neurological changes may also occur prior to the migraine, including drowsiness, incessant yawning, symptoms of dysphagia, such as difficulty in finding the right words, a reaction to excessive brightness or sound, and difficulty in eye focus. There may also be changes in behaviour such as hyperactivity, clumsiness or lethargy. 
and many sufferers report muscular symptoms such as general aches and pains. The second phase is the aura. The aura accompanies migraine attacks in about 20 to 30 percent of migraine sufferers. The most common aura symptoms are visual disturbances such as bright zigzag lines and flashing lights. As well as that, there may be difficulty in focusing or blind spots. The aura commonly affects only one eye, but it can disturb the visual field of both eyes. It usually lasts between 5 and 60 minutes, then the vision normally returns to normal. Less commonly, aura affects sensation or speech. The third phase is the headache. The headache phase can last for up to three days. It is often throbbing and on one side of the head, but it can affect both and it is made worse by any kind of movement. The most common accompanying symptoms in this phase are uh, sensitivity to light, sound and smell. Eating can help reduce symptoms, especially starchy foods such as breads and pastas. The symptoms can be more distressing than the headache itself. The final recovery stage may last for about 24 hours and feelings range from complete lethargy to feelings of high energy and even euphoria. Sleep often is beneficial for adults while effective medication can improve attacks for chronic sufferers. Children seem to feel much better after vomiting and for a few nothing works except the headache burning itself out. The dietary triggers include alcohol, especially red wine, certain types of food, notably aged cheese or chocolate, uh, withdrawal from caffeine or caffeinated drinks such as coffee and tea, the food additive monosodium glutamate, dehydration and inadequate meals. Environmental triggers include bright sunlight, flickering lights, Strong smells, for example, perfume, gasoline, uh, chemicals, smoke-filled rooms, and certain food odours. Another environmental trigger is high altitudes or flying. Weather changes can be a trigger factor, as can loud noises or overuse or incorrect use of computers. Other trigger factors include the hormonal triggers. Hormonal fluctuations are implicated as a significant trigger for women as three times as many women suffer from migraine headaches as men. This difference being most apparent during the reproductive years. The hormonal triggers may be menstruation and a UK study found that 50% of women are more likely to have migraine around menstruation ovulation, use of oral contraceptives, pregnancy, and it may be worse for the first few months, but in two-thirds of women it improves in the latter part. The physical and emotional factors which can trigger migraine include a lack of sleep or oversleeping, and even as little as half an hour difference in routine, such as sleeping in on the weekends, can make that difference. Illness, such as a viral infection or a cold. Stiff and painful muscles, especially in the scalp, jaw, neck, shoulders and upper back. Sudden or vigorous exercise. Emotional triggers, such as arguments or excitement. And relaxation after stress, which is known as the weekend headache. There are a variety of treatments available for migraine sufferers and non-medication treatments such as ice can, in some cases, reduce the impact of a migraine episode. This is because during a migraine, the blood vessels in the head tend to dilate, which means they open more widely. They may become swollen with blood 
and this in turn leads to pressure on the nerves surrounding them. The nerves begin to send pain signals before the onset of migraine. Wrapping the head with an ice pack can bring migraine relief through the cooling of the blood vessels. As the blood vessels cool, they become constricted and return to normal size. This can lessen blood flow to the head and as a result reduce pressure on the nerves, thereby providing relief from pain. Another non-medication treatment is biofeedback. The biofeedback technique trains people to improve their health by controlling certain bodily processes that normally happen involuntarily, such as heart rate, blood pressure and muscle tension. Relaxation techniques may also be helpful at stopping an attack once it has started. The techniques include deep breathing, massage and stretching. Individuals with occasional mild migraine headaches that do not interfere with daily activities usually medicate themselves with over-the-counter non-prescription pain relievers such as paracetamol, aspirin or NSAIDs like ibuprofen. For people who suffer migraines very frequently, prophylactic medication that is taken on a daily basis may be a good option. As a general rule, patients who experience migraines twice or more per month or have migraines which interfere with their quality of life may benefit from this type of medication. Now, turn over and look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. I'm here with Dr. Jeffrey McLean, who's an expert in neuromuscular disease. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become a neuromuscular disease expert? Well, uh, my, I started out with my general neurology training, uh, which I did at Wilford Hall Medical Center. And from there, I did a fellowship in neuromuscular medicine at, before returning to where I am now. And what's your typical day like? What kinds of patients do you see? I, I see a fairly broad mix of patients, uh, but when I'm doing specifically neuromuscular medicine, I do a lot of procedures, uh, electromyography, which is a procedure that we use to help diagnose neuromuscular diseases. The type of patients we see range from patients with neuropathies um, to patients with muscle diseases that we call myopathies to patients with disorders of the connection between the nerves and the muscles, neuromuscular junction disorders such as myasthenia gravis, um, to problems with the motor neurons such as ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. 
So a variety of very common diseases and some that are more rare and, and very, uh, have very serious prognoses. Exactly. That's right. And uh, what is the most exciting new development in your field? Which of those conditions have something new to offer patients who are listening? I think perhaps the most exciting field where we've seen a lot of attention recently is, has been ALS especially with the ice bucket challenge recently mm -hmm. that garnered so much public attention, so much public excitement, that excitement has transferred into more attention, more funding for more research. Things that are looking at improving our understanding of the genetics that play into ALS, where there's a lot of work being done trying to find biomarkers, so things that can be tested easily to more readily diagnose ALS and understand how it progresses in a particular patient. All these things ultimately help us find and uh, research uh, possible treatments that in the end are, are hopefully will lead us to things that will really benefit patients. And up until now there really has not been a great deal to offer an ALS patient. What, what do you do today? The, right now what we're focused on is improving the quality of life while people are dealing with this disease and that's an important thing for both patients and physicians to understand that while we don't have a cure there are many things that can be done to significantly improve the quality of life for our patients. So things like help with communication because many of the patients lose the ability to control their voice and control their speaking. So we can do things to help them communicate as that occurs. Things uh, like assistance with nutrition because they have difficulty swallowing and eating. So helping them with that. One of the big and often under-recognized problems with ALS are mood problems that go along with it. Um, obviously it's a devastating diagnosis and um, the social support is very important that we offer that to our patients to make sure that their, um, again, their quality of life is, is as high as possible while dealing with this. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, neuropathies for which we can offer a whole variety of treatments. Is right. there anything new or exciting for the patient with diabetes or someone else with, with neuropathy? To Consider. Well, again, there, there's a lot of new research going on. There's a, a lot of exciting um, work in terms of trying to find ways to treat the, the pain, often painful diabetic neuropathies. There are already some drugs currently available that many patients will be familiar with. And as time goes forward, we hope to increase the number of drugs that are available to make them more effective with fewer side effects. So hopefully that will be very soon on the horizon. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
Please subscribe this channel and press the bell icon. Are you one of those 90% viewers who have not subscribed us and they miss our videos daily?